Thank you. So we're going to start with you know the 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 main event uh, conceptually here, human values, and and I'm very pleased to have this really interesting and uh, distinguished group of people uh, to talk about values. All three of them are living them out in their work, um, and uh, let me just briefly introduce them. Um, from your right to left, Michael, Reverend Michael McFarland, who is a, uh, a Jesuit, who is cr former president of the College of the Holy Cross. Uh, he was also a computer scientist who has a PhD from, uh, in computer science from Carnegie Mellon, which he went back and got as a Jesuit, interestingly. And he, I want to ask him how that all fit together in a minute. Um, and he has done a lot of work in computer ethics. Uh, he's currently uh, in a position of leadership in the Jesuits in the Northeast United States. Uh, next to him is Erica Koshi, who is the Executive Director on Innovation uh, at UNICEF Innovation. And so she works in UNICEF doing technology, and she's doing some really interesting things. And finally, Julie Hanna, who is a good friend of mine and who I'm very pleased was willing to do this relatively last minute who is uh, currently the Presidential Ambassador for Global Entrepreneurship and has been spending a lot of time with the President and also Secretary Pritzker, who will be here in the morning. Last time I looked at Secretary Pritzker's Twitter page, there was a picture of the President with his arm around Julie on Secretary <laughs> Pritzker's Twitter homepage, which I thought was great. Um, she's also uh, chair of, executive chair of the board of Kiva. She's been a serial entrepreneur in both for-profit and non-profit organizations. So I really don't know who to start with. Um, uh, what was I? I had sort of a basic idea. I think I want to start with you, Julie. I don't know why, because I know, I know you the best. I know you'll say something uh, that will be provocative and useful to everybody, although I have no doubt about the other two. But when, why did you want to be on a session on values and technology? Because you did want to be on it. Um, I, I would say it, be, it begins with the realization that I had uh, a number of years ago is that I believe our, value, our values and beliefs shape the kind of businesses, organizations, and products that we create. And I didn't quite understand how true that was until I began to connect the dots on my own life in hindsight. As, as Steve Jobs said, you can only connect the dots on your life in hindsight. And I realized that, you know, I had self-identified as a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, that's how people knew me, but that my life began in a very different place. I, I'm, I'm uh, an Egyptian immigrant, I, had, uh, I was a refugee of war, and those experiences going from the front lines of war to the front lines of the tech revolution had really shaped my value system. Um, and I began to think about how without even my having a conscious awareness what the red thread and everything that I'd done and all the products I'd built and the companies that I had helped build. And it was really based on a, a, a fundamental belief that um, the greatest form of justice is fair access. And because as a child coming to the States, um, my parents, I watched my parents struggle, not able to get jobs. We didn't have a steady place to live. Um, they were educated and resourceful, but they couldn't get access. And I saw how that began chipping away at my family's dignity. And I came to realize that circumstances beyond our control can shape our own identity and that they can become a permanent part of our psyche. And so that, in me, created a sense of wanting to I dreamt about helping create a world that recognized dignity as a human right, um, that recognizes that talent <coughs> is universal, but opportunity isn't, uh, a world that understands that the opposite of poverty isn't wealth, but rather justice, and that fair access is a cornerstone of justice. And those were the things that were kind of the red thread in, 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 in what I began working in. And, Technology to me became a, a democratizing force. So when I studied computer science and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do with my life, I began seeing it as a way of leveling the playing field, as a way of enabling the kind of access that my family hadn't gotten. Do you think it is? <clears throat> it is. And yet, I think what's important to do is to tease apart the potential 
from the reality. So we have this potential for greater access that we've seen play out in certain parts of the world. And yet, alongside that potential, there's greater inequity. Um, it, you know, we have the hollowing out of the middle class. We have you know, terms like, instead of haves and have-nots, we've got have-it-alls and everyone else. Um, half the world lives on less than $2 a day. Um, and most of those people are micro entrepreneurs. Uh, they don't have access. And so it, it has that potential, but our values and beliefs and our intentions shape how we direct the power of technology to solve kind of humanity's greatest challenges. So that, that's why I want to be on this panel. So Michael, as a computer scientist who is in the religion business, so to speak, uh, and uh, how do you feel about that and what Julie just said? And or are you worried about values as they are expressed in our modern technology? I am, uh, I, and I completely agree with Julie uh, that two essential elements here are human dignity and justice. Uh, I, I think it's important to think about the person, the human individual, and how technology impacts them. But we also have to see them in the larger social context, which is easy to miss, I think, uh, especially as Americans and in the West, we tend to think, we tend to center on the individual. But we have to realize that people, uh, to be fully human, live a very complex social life, not only their individual one-on-one -on -one relationships, but the institutions within which they live, which uh, provide a, a, a context for them, mm -hmm. uh, nourish them, challenge them, help them grow, and help them to function. So we need to see that as aspect of it. And so uh, we have to ask ourselves, uh, where is the justice in uh, the way technology is developed and used? Who's excluded? Who are the voices that are not heard when we uh, develop technology? What assumptions are embedded in our technology? For example, if you develop uh, workplace technology where the assumption is where uh, our, our goal is to create greater efficiency and greater productivity, and you don't think about the impact on the workers, you will develop one type of technology, and that will have very powerful impact on, on workers and sometimes really devastating impact. On the other hand, if you start with the experience of the worker and say, how can we enhance that experience? How can we empower that person? How can we help him or her enrich his work life and the contribution that he or she can make then you develop often a very different technology and it has very different uh, implications. You could talk about that in relation to education. If you see education as pushing information out and doing it as efficiently as possible, um, sometimes that's all people are looking for, for, but you can undermine the important formative dimension of education where the, uh, where the person is formed as an individual and as a social being and uh, you develop the technology very differently. So technology embeds our values and our assumptions, and if we're not critical about those assumptions, and also if we can't get out of our own point of view as technologists, which can be narrow in some ways, uh, then it can have a very deleterious effect. I think. So Erica, how are we doing on asking those questions? And, and how do you ask them at UNICEF, and how, how do you assess how the technology industry is doing with that. So um, when we started uh, developing technology for our programs on, on the ground at UNICEF, this was about seven years ago, there was no real technology solution out there that met any of our needs. And so I think that gives a good indication that, um, that the people who are developing technology were not developing them for uh, the poorest of the poor, clearly, because there was no nothing, nothing matched. The only sort of common denominator that we could find was a text message. Mm -hmm. Because even on the most basic phone, you have the ability to send a text and make a phone call. Uh, but smartphones, they were not um, really available, still not very available, increasingly so, but not, not yet. And um, a lot of the content that was also being developed was so high bandwidth 
that uh, it was completely inaccessible uh, based on the device, or even if there was a smart device based on the data plan that you would need to have it. Um, so I think it's very clear that technology is not developed for uh, those who probably need it uh, the most. Uh, so the approach we take is uh, we hack things together and uh, we use what's out there. We try to do the heavy lifting in the cloud, but essentially we've had to build our own technology solutions uh, for uh, the, the places that we work in because they don't exist. And so I think a good example of that is um, a program that we have called, is, that's called U Report. And U, U Report. U Report, like U Report. And uh, young people in, it's now in 18 countries, can sign up using a text message. They send the word join um, to, to a short code. And then they become U Reporters. And they are asked one question every week about what's happening in their community, their views on certain things. So an example I was giving earlier uh, was a couple weeks ago in Liberia, where we have 17,000 U reporters. We sent out a uh, text message uh, asking young people if um, they were trading sex for grades, because we had heard that this was an issue in the country, but we didn't really know. And what we heard back overwhelmingly was that 86% of young people said that yes, it was a problem. So clearly, I mean, terrible. In their school, in they their were school, aware of it happening. They were aware of it happening. And so we immediately used this information to you know, set up an emergency task force, to set up a hotline, to try to respond uh, and deal with this, clearly, this huge, huge problem in the country. Um, but we had to build that system called Report, which runs on a platform called Rapid Pro, uh, ourselves because we can't, couldn't use Facebook for it because of the privacy issues. We couldn't use, and then no one had access to Facebook because they didn't have smartphones. Um, and they didn't have the data plan to, to use it either. We couldn't use Twitter because it wasn't widely used there. The only, the lowest common denominator we could find was, was a text message. And I think that if you look at other products out there, for example, even the Android operating system, which is probably the most widely used operating system uh, out there on the smartphone market, it's built for a data plan. Like your apps, they're constantly running in the background, pulling down information. It's not built for people who are living uh, on less than $2 a day and every single thing that they own, they buy things in small packages. Um, if you've seen soap is sold in individual packages because that's what you can afford on the day that you buy it. Uh, not, uh, you can't afford uh, you know, a monthly plan or you can't even afford a big thing of soap. Uh, so I think we need to think about if we are going to build products and services for people who are not us, right, and who are not privileged to be sitting here and talking about these things, we really need to, to think about it from the user's point of view and the, things, the products and services that they need uh, to um, sort of help their lives, but you know, I'll also allow them to, to lift themselves out of poverty. Erica, sure, surely that's very relevant to nonprofits, but you know, we have companies that are in, they have to make money. How do you reconcile your mindset on this with, with that rea reality? And, and what do you think that should be the mindset of companies that are in business to generate a profit, but that want to partake of this world that you're describing? Mm, I would argue that you can do both. Um, I think um, a really good example of it is um, M-Pesa, which is all throughout East Africa. It's a very commonly used example. But one thing people don't necessarily know about it is that it's a mobile money service. 42% of, of Kenya's GDP flows through the, that service on a daily basis in Kenya. Yeah. In Kenya. And they take anywhere from um, a you know, 2% to 50% you know, cut of the transaction, depending on how small or large of it, it is. So clearly, they're making money. And I think other spaces that are really ripe for, for disruption um, that can, uh, where businesses can make money and also do a tremendous amount of good are the transportation sector on, on the technology side, the wearables and sensor sector, the learning and education sector, and obviously the financial, financial services sector. I think you were gonna say the thing you said to me at the reception before about how companies ought to be. Yeah, I really think that the, um, their, business, their core business needs to be completely aligned with uh, the corporate social responsibility. It shouldn't be something that you do on the side. It should be the products and services that you develop should be providing social good um, and 
there's many, many different ways you can partner with, um, you know, whether if the public sector, other companies, local social enterprises, I think, to make that happen. Julie, you're a serial entrepreneur and a business person, among your other things you've done. Is that easily done? I mean, is that a reasonable way to think about it? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's interesting you're asking the question because in a way it is um, symptomatic of the fact that we've somehow found ourselves in a place where we um, have created a false choice between purpose and profit uh, or between mission and business. We kind of this dualistic mindset that when we think about uh, purpose or, you know, bettering the world, we think through sort of a charity lens. When we think about business, we think through a profit maximization, kind of hyper profit maximization lens. And, and it does, that is not necessary and it hasn't always been that way. And um, you know, the Silicon Valley I came to 22 years ago, um, there, there's always been this mission driven ethos. We often talk about mission and mercenary driven cultures in Silicon Valley. And, um, Mission-driven, we know both can be financially successful. We also uh, recognize that mission-driven cultures tend to be better places to work. They engender a greater sense of, of uh, loyalty amongst employees and uh, customers. They, they make us passionate about their products and they often become enduring institutions and society's exemplars. And the, the greatest entrepreneurs uh, in tech are very mission-driven, so I, I think that Sometimes we forget that, that you know, Larry and Sergey's goal was to organize the world's information, connecting every human being on the planet. These are kind of mission purpose driven. If you, if you look at the half of the world uh, that I mentioned earlier lives on less than $2 a day, if you look at it through a market lens, you could say this is the world's largest underserved market. Mm -hmm. And there's a massive economy there. You go to the Kibera slum in Kenya, which is the largest slum in all of Africa, and I, it is a hyper-networked environment where there's tremendous amount of commerce going, happening very efficiently. So um, I, I think it's, it, we created this false choice. It doesn't have to be that way. You, and Michael, I want to hear from you in a second, but you, when we talked on the phone, we're talking about unconscious ethnocentric bias, right? You're being much kinder to the industry here than you were on the phone. <laughs> Talk about that. Well, I, I think I'll, I'll start with something that Jessie said in her 90 seconds, which I was really heartened to hear. Um, I often think about if there was one key to success, um, whether it's building the world's best products, businesses, changing the world, it's, it's uh, a, a, a deep, radical practice of empathy, radical empathy. Because when you exercise that, you, you go deeply into climbing into someone else's head and you look at the world through their eyes. So when we sit in Silicon Valley, one of the things that we're at risk of having happen that, is sometime, that does happen now is we begin thinking about our own problems in the bubble of privilege that we are in and we solve for those and we keep solving for them. Or we, we think about solving for the globe but through our own lens. Uh, and so it, it's very important to find ways to pop out of that bu bubble and to, experience, to, to exercise radical empathy um, you know, the hybridization of knowledge and experience uh, and the diversity of entrepreneurship is critical to this because if we want to have, you know, I think entrepreneurs are the world's greatest change agents. It's being an entrepreneur is fundamentally, it's a mindset about creating a future you want to live in. If we want a future that represents the diversity of the planet, then we would do well to ignite as diverse of a population as possible around entrepreneurship. Smart people with deep values and, and highly varied backgrounds. I think that's the best way to inoculate, if you will, a, a, against this ethnocentricity that may be happening unconsciously. And really quickly in your ambassadorship, you're doing that on a global scale? Is that what you're trying to yes. do? Sort of help stimulate the idea of entrepreneurship everywhere as much as possible? Okay. I want to get to Michael, uh, but I just wanted to make sure that, that you nodded there. Um, how is the business community and the tech industry doing on this empathy thing, Michael? Well, I, I think that uh, what's happened right now is we, we've become a, a shareholder-driven culture and economy almost exclusively, and I think we have to think about who are all the stakeholders in a business. Customers, uh, the workers, 
uh, all those who are affected by what the business does and those who are excluded from the business activity and the larger community. Uh, people reject this, but uh, uh, businesses can't function without the infrastructure that's created by the country, by the communities they're in, mm -hmm. by the educational system. I mean, there are a lot of people that contribute to the success of a business beyond the shareholders who invest their capital there. And yet, there's not enough attention paid to um, paying back those people who have given so much to make that work. When, uh, when I was out, just getting out of graduate school, I, I was privileged to work at Bell Laboratories back in its heyday in the 80s and 90s, where some of the great minds in the world were uh, working, which had given uh, our world, so many great technologies. Well, that existed because AT&T was a utility. Uh, it made money, but it was protected in some ways by the government. And it was just expected that it would invest a certain amount of its income back in the community. And you saw it at a corporate level, but you also saw it in individuals. They had the pioneer groups who uh, did service in the community. It was the whole culture was about giving back. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's what allowed us. Because they the, took so much, though. I mean, let's, Yeah, let's no, get, I mean, right. they guaranteed income, right? And, and, and our, our phone rates are certainly lower because they're not a utility. But where do you find the balance there where it's recognized that uh, other stakeholders matter? And I, I want to hear Eric on, the, on this, too. But you know, I want to understand the pragmatic way to un interpret this. Because you're saying we should do this. but. I remember when we were on the phone, you asserted to me the Pope is not a communist. Without me questioning that, by the way, uh -huh. you brought it up. Uh, but the, the, the bottom line, I believe, is that you believe that it's actually for business's best interest. I mean, it's not just like, this is the thing I think we need to get this conversation toward. Is It's not just about like, oh, yeah, we're going to be nice people, right? It's no. about, if we don't do this, what do you worry is going to happen? And then, Eric, I'd like you to well, ask the same I, question. Well, to go back to my example of AT&T, I, I worry a lot, especially as an educator, about uh, our failure to invest in long-term uh, research and development. I mean, back when I was in grad school, not only the government was investing through DARPA and, and Office of Naval Research and the National Science uh, Foundation, but uh, you had places like IBM, AT&T, um, and then later uh, Fujitsu had labs that were just there to develop technology. They, they, did, they were always interested in technology. You're one of the few people that remembers Fujitsu had it. Yeah, right. Yeah, we don't they, talk about that too often. Yeah, they had one in Princeton that was pretty good. And, and I think they were at Berkeley also. So uh, I, don't, I don't see that happening. I mean, people want to know that there'll be a product coming out of this a year from now. And uh, I mean, you see Google, I think, right now is, is doing some of that. But they keep repurposing and drawing back in, too. And yeah. I know their shareholders are after them not to do some of these visionary product, projects. So I, I think we have to change the culture about how we think about business and what it means to be successful. I mean, does it just mean making, making your next quarter uh, uh, targets on, on uh on, on profits and uh, revenue. I, I think it's a lot more than that. To, to, to give Google credit, I, I don't think they're letting those shareholders stop them from doing a lot of pretty wild stuff. And, and right. Erica, you actually said something positive about Google also. Could you want to, I mean, anything you want to say is interesting. Yeah, I mean, I think their, um, their ethos is, is the right one, um, um, much more so than many other com companies out there. But I think that if, um, the private sector, sort of, and I say this as a blanket whole, um, not necessarily startups that don't have the capital, but especially the established private sector, doesn't start thinking about developing products and services that have sort of empathy at the core of them or for people who are not sitting in this room. Um, I think that they're going to lose out very quickly. We're seeing, if you look at just look at the demographics over the next 15 years, basically all countries that we know as sort of rich countries are shrinking in population, like the average age in Germany is uh, 48, in Nigeria it's 18. Um, we're going to see huge growth in, 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 in Africa in terms of population and in Asia as well. 
Um, we're also going to see a shift of power to, uh, to the east and to the south. Um, more than half of the middle class in 15 years will be in Asia. And if you look at uh, sort of the middle class in uh, the US and in Europe and in Japan, it'll be a much smaller proportion. So when you think about where your next customer is, if you want to be around as a business in you know, 10 years, you better be thinking towards developing products and services that are relevant for your next customer. And the products and services we have today are not at all. OK, who wants to jump into this conversation from the audience, either with a comment or a question? Anybody want to, uh, are there burning desire to say something? I don't, I've got to put my hand in front of my eyes. No, nobody's got anything that they're shocked about and they want to challenge or, or echo. Um, the thing that I was thinking about as you were just talking um, was the comment uh, about China that Rowan made. Um, uh, and I do believe that you know a country led by PhD engineers, although the current head of state is not a PhD engineer, but he's the first one that, it, that wasn't. And there's still a, most of the leaders are, and uh, they understand how this stuff works, and, and we don't basically at the governmental level. And and that's, I think if, if that, and I thought this was where you were going, by the way. That you know it's funny. Even the Wall Street Journal had a piece over the over the weekend, or like was it Friday or Saturday, about you know, declining faith in capitalism, right? If business wants to continue to be the engine of growth in society, which we celebrate and we even say it in our first page of our magazine, that's what we believe at Techonomy, they're gonna have to actually do a little bit better job, right? I mean, somebody else pick up on that. I think people will, de will demand it. Um, yeah. As more, and especially as, you know, the, the sort of influence of the state or the public sector as we know it wanes, um, which I think we are seeing, uh, and sort of there's a definitely a rise in sort of the corporate strength, um, and more and more of your data is with uh, you know these corporations. I think people will start to, I hope people will start to demand more of um, of these companies um, because of their strength and their influence in your lives. I had a very interesting conversation with uh, the CEO of Kickstarter uh, a few days ago, and. Um, you know, Kickstarter, I think, famously uh, changed their structure to B Corp. Structure. Just recently, yeah. Just recently. And it was very interesting to hear, kind of get inside what motivated that. And I think he's represented... A B Corp a, being a company that has dual sorry, purpose, not dual, just to yes. make money, but also to serve the community. Yes. And, and one of the drivers was this around this desire to recognize that you have stakeholders beyond just shareholders, that... that that at the deepest kind of value they wanted to be in integrity with is being in service to stakeholders and the con community and, and all constituents. And his frame was interesting because I think he's representative of sort of a growing sentiment that we have an economic system that creates almost sort of a lottery ticket kind of mindset around big exits and the, the, the unicorn obsession and, and, and determining value creation, assuming the value creation is synonymous with valuation. And we, we, we've somehow, we're starting to talk about those kind of almost interchangeably and teasing them apart and kind of saying, actually, you want to get off this ride. Um, we want to create something of kind of enduring, lasting value. We want to be profitable. We will share in those profits equitably. But we, we want to get off of this ride with a lottery ticket sort of chase game around valuation and being only focused on shareholders. And I think there's a growing sentiment around kind of how we think about the model of capitalism that we're exercising, which is in a way it's sort of a, a money creating, chasing more money model, uh, very much about growth and where does this kind of end uh, eventually. So I think there's an interesting conversation that's starting to emerge. Another interesting statistic in this Wall Street Journal article it was a series of statistics created by someone with Simone's here, Legatum. I don't know if she's here. The research was done by Legatum uh, about surveying people in countries around the world about their expectation that their next generation would be happier, healthier, and wealthier. And the, the, the number went down by the mo by development of the country. The least developed countries, I think India was where it was the highest level of optimism, and the U.S. was the lowest. Only 14% of Americans said they think the next generation will live a better life than they do. And the article was pointing out, it's 
arguably not true. I mean, we're already, if, at, a, at a massive level, the world is living better right now. I think that's demonstrable and, and measurable. But the faith in that is so low in, in our society. Um, anybody in the audience? OK. There's, and, and then we'll go to you. And I want to ask you one question before we end, for sure. Go ahead. The, the mic's coming to you right now. Thank you very much for the mic handling. I'm John from Hyundai Motors. Um, in, in this discussion about human values, and I know that we're looking at the underserved communities, but we don't look that very far. And you know, Dave, in your opening comments that there's sexting going on in, in US high school, I think is also part of the story, too. That's indicative of how we have, we're not protecting the youngest of our country here today, let alone those in the developing world. And I also question, are we shocked by that news? Are we shamed? Are we, do we feel distraught, embarrassed by that kind, of, that kind of thing happening? And I think to the extent that we ought to feel ashamed and embarrassed by that happening, and we ought to think about how we ought to, you know, can make it a difference, even, even here in the US. Thank you, interesting comment. Um, over here, can we get the mic here? And then well, let's get a few more voices on, this, on the floor. We've got only three minutes and 34 seconds, but we'll do it fast. Arjuna Costa from the Omidyar Network. Quick question for the uh, panelists. Um, millen the millennial generation thinks about their careers very differently from the generation before that. Purpose becomes so much more central. It didn't come up in the conversation. I'd be curious as to what the panelists think about that and what that implies for the future of sort of corporate development. I, I think of it as, um, the self-correcting mechanism that humanity has built in, in a way. I mean, I think our, this generate the millennial generation has sort of looked at the model of success that 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 their parents grew up with. That we and and they kind of said, if that's your idea of success, um, you don't look very happy. Uh, we want to kind of create a, a more purposeful existence. And so the statistics are compelling. And I think I think that what Kickstarter actually the reason I raised them as an example is they are representative of this sort of how. Um, purpose-driven values, uh, aligning those with business. Um, there's, a, there's a search for doing that amongst millennials. So it, it gives me great hope because the question about purpose and meaning comes up very early in the context of business when you talk to millennials. It is funny, though, they used to say that was true of the baby boomers back in the yes. day. Uh, it seemed <laughs> not to play out. Was there somebody over there? Okay, why did you people not have your hands up before? Okay, this person, and then we'll get to you. And then I saw a hand over here somewhere, too. And maybe we should just get a bunch of voices out, and then we'll have a response from here. Hey, guys. I'm Brooks Bell. Hey, Julie. Hi, Brooks. Hi. So um, when you're talking about kind of the, the issues with having multiple stakeholders and not optimizing to any of them besides a shareholder, I was just thinking about the role of data in all of this. I think to some degree, there is incredible proliferation of data that we're managing our businesses to. And the easiest things to measure are the short-term metrics of, of revenue and profit. And so, of course, you optimize towards those, those measurements. I think that, so I think as, as we get more data, the more short-term focused we become. And I think that's driving some of these, these issues. I think data is also the solution to these issues as we come, become a lot more sophisticated and use data to more in predicting long-term value and changing the metrics that we're measuring against, me metrics that are a lot more difficult to measure, mm -hmm. I think that will be a really important solution out of this, this situation that we're in. Very interesting. OK, well, let's try to be as fast as we can with all these, please. So I have a question here about the Identify yourself, sorry. Uh, my name is Yatish Rajavat. Yatish, oh, hi. hi. I run a citizen engagement platform in India. And I was very interested in this uh, comment about the shareholder economy because, uh, I mean, we feel that somehow the shareholder economy actually makes a lot of policy decision of government geared towards uh, capitalization of few individuals' wealth. So that determines a lot of things that not only companies do, but a lot of things that government does. But this is easily solved by media, by, stopped, uh, by stopping a Fortune 500 list of based on revenues and market capitalization to uh, different metrics. It can be easily changed by policy, financial policy, or like in India it's been done that a portion of profits needs to be transferred to a fund. 
per, by every company and you know 2% of the funds from the profit have to be transferred. It can also be done by who do we look as heroes? I mean, there is this myth and that the unicorn, the guys who create unicorns are the heroes. They are the leaders. And I, you know, I fail to understand this thing about leadership being linked to the amount of wealth that guy has created or the amount of flip that he has done. So my question was that, you know, I mean, especially to Julie that, you know, is there a policy decision here which can be exercised to change this uh, mindset itself? Okay, really fast. Oh. I mean, policy, laws, funds, yes. forcing companies to do the right thing, in effect. It's more yeah. of an Indian idea than an American one, I would say. But anyway. yeah. <laughs> I mean, there, is a, there is obviously an interaction between policy and business practices. And I think that the, the, the part of the challenge in the U, here in the US with, with the, is, is we believe in the system that we've constructed. And I think policy changes um, to, ch to change the will to change that becomes very tricky and difficult. So I, I, t I tend to say policy follows innovation. Um, that's the entrepreneur in me. And so I, I began with what can you do innovatively as an entrepreneur to succeed and thrive by changing the rules of the game, and policy will follow that. Okay, uh, okay, Jody, real fast. Jody Westby. So I, I look at this title, Human Values, and I think about Black Lives Matter. I think about um, the Middle East and Arab Spring and freedom of expression. Um, I think about access to um, internet and all of our, um, you know, open internet debate now. Um, whether videos are intimidating law enforcement, and how can we take these technological um, trends and make them global? How can we link them to international law? How can we make them something that starts becoming more movement, not just something that happens in this country? Okay, or, that's a great question. But I have one, even though I know I have to end, I wanted to ask you, Michael, to end by, by, you told me that you went to get a degree in computer science after you became a Jesuit, and you said that in the context of how the Jesuits try to con connect with the transcendent issues in the culture. Can you draw that connection? Why? as a Jesuit, you felt you needed to get a computer science degree? Well, I, I'd always been uh, interested in science and technology. But when I first got out of college, before I was a Jesuit, I spent four years on an Indian reservation. And we had taken a system from Stanford on, uh, uh, on computer-assisted instruction. What year? This was uh, 1971. 1971 yeah, computer-assisted yeah, We're in a little mud brick school. He did it. And the kids are banging away on Model 33 teletypes. Yeah. But, uh, but we put it in the context of their culture. We didn't try to make them uh, Stanford students. I mean, the, the parents were very supportive. We had local aides in the room. In fact, I trained my aide to take over the system when I left, who was from the village there. Uh, and we were able to take kids that were two years behind by fourth grade and bring them up a year and a half with just a year's work of work, supplementing the classroom. Uh, and, and it was very human-centered, uh, a lot of relational stuff. But the computers gave the kids a chance to work on their own level, to um, compete against the computer and not against each other, because it's a culture that frowns on competition between people. So we were able to find a way to insert it in that culture uh, that was marginalized in many ways and bring some benefits there. But we did it by respecting the culture and the people there and letting it revolve around them and who they were. And it was a learning-centered technology uh, focused on, on the learner and not on, on the corporation or, the, uh, or, or somebody's sense of what needed to be done. Um, and that, you could see how that could integrate those different things. And, and ultimately, technology is human, and we're always interested in what's human uh, and, and finding what's deeper and more beautiful about that. Well, I'm glad I asked. Well, thank you. Thank you for a great discussion. We could go on all day, but at least we got two more days of related stuff. So thank you for all three of you <laughs> contributing so much.